the subject of today's lesson is uh, timber trusses. So we want to say some general concepts about uh, how to design a timber truss system. So let me just put the remote control on my laptop. It's easier. <coughs> So, we will start by saying a few words about uh, uh, advantages of different trusses over different systems and also possible configurations. Then we will talk about some timber trusses for short and long spans. We will see that there is a significant difference if we use a timber truss for short span or if we use a timber truss for long span. I would say that in Italy we never use timber trusses for short span, we just use it for long span if needed. Some formula for preliminary design that could be useful if, uh, uh, for example, you decide to do uh, your uh, project using timber trusses. Then some concept about truss design. And then we will talk about the serviceability limit state of the flexion control according to the Euro code 5. And then we will see some photos about the uh, fixed truss taken from a real structure in uh, New Zealand. So, truss systems usually are uh, uh, considered as a simply supported external systems used to resist gravity vertical loads. Of course, they can also be used as a bracing system, for example, diagonal bracing system to take the lateral load, and also to provide some lateral stabilization against out of plane buckling. We already if you remember, we've already been discussing a lot about the need when we have a truss system or when we have a general frame system to provide some restraint against out of grade flexural backing because otherwise there is no way that we can get our ultimate limit state uh, verification of uh, bending with flexural torsional backing satisfied. So, some advantages compared with solid structures high material efficiency. Of course, the idea of a truss system is basically to take away, if you want, starting from a beam which, from a system which has to resist a vertical load. So we could say, okay, I have to resist a vertical load, so I have a system which is in some way loaded in bending. And the idea is that, uh, okay, bending, which are the most effective parts of our cross section? This was a solid cross section. For bending, we know that the most effective part are the outer and the, and the lower fibers. So the idea is that I can basically cut away all the inner part of the material in order to get the material distributed where they need more for bending, which is the upper and the lower core. Of course, this is not enough because in addition to bending, we need also to resist warmth. So if I, have, if I have a system like this, made of two parallel cords, I can get some bending in the system. But what do I need, in addition, to resist? Okay, to bending, also to which other kind of force? Now, in this case, if you have vertical force, in general, I don't have axial force. I have a bending moment, but I have another kind of force. Shear. And of course, for shear, what, what do I need to place my material in order to resist to shear? More or less around the neutral axis, so more or less here. So this alone is not enough, so the idea is that to get to get something like this. So to go from a system which is less effective to a system, to a system which is more effective, where, where I have basically take away the material from the part where I need less material. So if you want, this is kind of optimization, it's a kind of shape optimization in order to get, uh, to reduce the amount of material needed to resist uh, vertical load. And so to resist, to resist both bending and, uh, of course, shear. Of course, we have also great design freedom because we can, for example, while with a solid timber, I mean, usually I should keep as a constant cross section, I can do 
um, kind of paper cross-section, but it would be more difficult to have, for example, a card in Tradox. In this case, with a, with a trust system, I have more flexibility because I can have a, a different kind of geometry. When, for example, I can have a geometry like this. <coughs> of course, by changing the length of my diagonals uh, here. So, great design freedom can easily be made in several parts to facilitate transportation. In this case, of course, the, the system is made from smaller, from shorter members that can then be connected together on the building side, or even what we usually do, we can split this, the whole beam in three pieces, one, two, and three. We can prefabricate those pieces, also the joints of the, uh, within the single pieces into the workshop, and then we can bring together in the building side those three pieces, and then we can connect only those three pieces together with the building side. In this way, of course, I optimize the workmanship because I do most of the joints are done already on the building, uh, are done already on the workshop, while only the connection between, between among those three sections three section are made on the building side. And of course, low, low self-quality to easy handling factory on site with low transportation costs. Cost. Because the material of the structure is very, is very lightweight. Now, for short spans, so 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 meters, this is what you would consider a short span, timber trusses are usually triangular with some timber members, and many plates of those metal plates are nodes. So, so, typically for short spans, we are using some timber and we are using metal plates or two-third metal plates or nail plates. However, for longer spans, we use mostly glue laminated timber. Very often, if we go to longer span, we, use a, we have a glue lamp member for the top cord and for the bottom cords. The top cord usually follows the shape of the roof. So, for example, if you have a, if you have a pitch roof, the top cord will follow the, the shape of the, of, the, of the roof. Otherwise, we can have a cup shape and so on. And uh, the shape of the bottom bed, of the bottom member is determined by architectural requirements. Of course, from the bottom cords or upper and lower currents, as I said, you will become top and bottom cords, are connected by intermediate vertical and of the diagonal members forming a series of triangles. Just a reminder that as you study the statics, a typical truss system is made by a number of triangles. Okay, so if your truss system can be divided in triangles, triangles with nodes at the ends, then this is a truss system. Otherwise, instead, for example, if you have triangles without nodes, it means that this is not a typical truss system. Okay? Of course, the, the typical truss system is a statically determined system, meaning that uh, we can solve the system using the equation of the statics, the equation of equilibrium. Here we have some typical shapes, so pitched conventional trusses, parallel of truss, and so on. For short span timber trusses, this is a typical solution. This photo is taken from New Zealand or anyway from uh, Anglo-Saxon countries where, as you can see, it's quite common to use some timber with uh, toothed metal plates. Solution that in Italy we, you will never find. We already mentioned, so we have some uh, punched metal plates fastener. They are basically pressed on top of the timber members using this kind of presses, as you see here. Instead for long stand timber trusses, we usually we have a blue, lab, blue laminated timber in connection with double type fastener as noted steel plates. You can see here some different uh, possibilities. Another nice photos when we have this kind of uh, uh, pitch and camber kind of uh, uh, truss system. So we have uh, an upper cord made of blue lamp. We have a lower cord, uh, which is a nice, made of blue lamp. Then we have, you see, some diagonal members, very slender, 
and some of the member, you can see, uh, in some of the member, the timber is replaced by uh, steel rods. Of course, when you use this kind of solution with steel rods, we need to be very careful because the steel rods can resist only what kind of eh? so only traction, only tension. So we need to be careful because we need really to do an analysis with all the load combination, particularly with the with the wind uplifting, because of, for some of the load combination you may get in this manner near compression. If you get compression, you can use it, you, you cannot use a rod, so the system will become unstable. Okay? Otherwise, of course, this is a very effective solution, as you can see here. You can also see some, if you look here, some crosses, so timber, some, some uh, cross bracing made of uh, uh, steel, the rods, in order to have that kind of uh, bracing for the whole system. You see also this kind of structure being used for very big, very large type structures here. In other photos, this is a typical again, you see very uh, strong lower core, upper core, and then again some diagonals. So, some formulas for preliminary design. The construction length should be adequate, of course. About one third of the span is suitable in parallel trusses. So, if your truss must span, let's say, 36 meters, you can expect that you need a, mid, a, a, a distance between the upper and lower core of 3 meters. So, 12 and 36 divided by 12, okay? In order of, to get a, a preliminary design. Because otherwise, you get a number that are too big. So, some more detailed relationship you see here for different shapes. So, when you have to design to put the, the design structure like this, first of all, you need to put the preliminary design to, to choose the geometry according to the typical span. Of course, if you have, if you have a design span of uh, 26 meters, and you can only use uh, among those uh, systems here, you can only do this system here, because the other one you see typical span are less than 26. So, you choose this one, and then you need to calculate. The depth and the depth can be calculated in this case between 8 and 10, so let's say 36 meters divided by 10, 3.6 meters of distance between the upper and the lower core, in order to get some reasonable size of your members. Okay, now we have some clauses within the Europe 5 in order to perform the design of a timber truss system. First of all, you see, there is a general rules, the rule saying that the analysis should be performed by frame models or by a simplified analysis for trussable punctured metal plate fasteners. Since in Italy we don't use really punctured metal plate fasteners, we are not going to tell anything about uh, uh, this simplified analysis. We are not talking about the general frame model. So, a frame model. Frame structure shall be analyzed such that the formations of the membrane joints, the influence of support the centricity and the stiffness of support the structure, take into account in the determination of the member force the moment. What does it mean? It means that when I do my structural model of my thrust system, I should just keep in mind that uh, we might have some support eccentricities that I should take into account, and also I should take into account. Uh, the deformation of the membrane, the joints. The formation of the membrane is quite obvious. The members are not rigid, are elastic, so I need to take into account that the members are flexible, absolutely flexible, but then also the deformation of the joints. The joints are made from dowels or fasteners and they have some flexibility, as you know. So, strictly speaking, I should take into account also about the flexibility of the joints, which is a bit more complex because, as you know, from statics, you know how to solve uh, a truss system and you know how to take into account the flexibility, the flexibility, the actual flexibility of the, of the beam can be taken into account if you want to calculate the total deflection using the principle of the virtual work, we are going to see later how to do it. If you want to take into account the flexibility of the joint, it's slightly more difficult because you, you need to add some other, um, uh, some other contributions to the reflection using again the principle of the calculator that works. We are going to see this later. So, this is an example of frame analysis model element. So, you have a, a truss system with, with made of timber. First of all, you need to schematize 
each of those members using a line, as you know. So your trust system is made from lines and pin connections. So, in a frame analysis, the system lines for all members shall lie within the member profile. So what does it mean? It means that when I, when I have to uh, do the model of a trust system, strictly speaking, my model should be made of frame elements with their axis on the center line of my timber member. So strictly speaking, I should draw a line in the center line of the, for example, of the uh, upper core, a line on the center line of the bottom core, and then strictly speaking also a line in the center line of the diagonal member. But the problem is that often, since those members are quite bigger, if I try, if, if, if I center the member on the center line of my, of my scheme, I don't have room to do the connection. So in other words, what, what is going to happen here? So, strictly speaking, my model should be centered on the center line of my members. This is, for example, a rectangular cross-section. But then you see that we might have a problem here because we don't, we don't have enough room to do after the connection between the members because the timber members, as you know, are a bit bulk. So, how can we solve this problem here? The regulation said the system lines for all members shall lie within the member profile. So, it means that I'm allowed to space a little bit apart those two members. So, to do something like this. So I can have an eccentricity between the actual member and the center, let's say, the, the actual member and the line schematizing the system that I want to solve. So in other words, in order to have enough room to do the connection, I need to space apart a little bit the members. This implies that, as you can see, the member can no longer be on the center line on the, let's say the, the member cannot be longer centered on the line of my system that I'm going to solve, for example, with some tower. Is it clear what I'm talking about? No. Yes. So, what we said before, theoretically, all the members should be centered on the line of my system. As you know, a system a trust system must have all the lines concurring in one node. So the, 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 to be a trust system shall be something like this. And here I need to consider a pin connection. Okay? So this is the kind of system that I need to solve in order to find all the forces, internal forces inside. However, it's very hard to respect this kind of uh, requirement when I use timber members because the timber members are big. So to respect this condition here, the timber members shall be in this way. And then I would have room to do the correction because uh, the, the two timber members centered on, the, on this slide would overlap over the connection video. So we don't have room to do the actual connection. So what do we need to do? We need to, ask to allow for some eccentricity between the actual member and those lines schematizing the trust system. 
the regulation, and now as we saw, you see that it, uh, it is written here, the system lines for all members shall lie within the member profile. So I'm allowed to have an eccentricity, providing that the, uh, basically, the system line lies within the member profile. So I'm allowed to move this member in this direction, this direction, provided you see that I have at least, I'm at least on the limit here with the center line. I'm not allowed to do something like this. I'm not allowed to move too much the member such that the system line is outside the member itself. So I cannot do this. So this is not allowed, so I am not allowed to move too much, you see, the timber member, such that the, 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 the system line doesn't fall within, doesn't lie within the thickness of the member. It's clear? Okay. I can tell you that the, the, the same criterion actually applies also for the design of steel trusses. Also for steel trusses we are allowed to have an eccentricity, also that we need to make sure that uh, the system line doesn't fall outside the thickness of the member itself. So, is, is, is that clear? This is the first important criterion to keep in mind. Second criterion for the main members, example, example the external member of a trust, the system line shall coincide with the member center line. So, the regulation said you can do this only for the secondary members. Let's call secondary members the uh, uh, diagonal members. But you cannot do this for the main members, which is basically the outer, the top, and bottom core. For the top and bottom core, as you can see, the system line must be centered on the member itself. So, I cannot have this eccentricity. On the top, on the bottom, and top part. The eccentricity, we can have this eccentricity if needed only on the other <coughs> members, the diagonal and vertical members. Okay? Other close. If the system lines of internal member do not coincide with the center lines, the influence of the eccentricity shall be taken into account in the standard verification of these members. What does it mean? It means that, you can see here, if this is my system, and you see there is this eccentricity here, of course, when I solve the system, I will find some forces, F2, F1, and F2, those forces, as a result of my uh, structural analysis, will be applied on a member which is eccentric with respect to the force. So when I do the strain verification of those diagonal members, I have to see, I have to consider this eccentricity. So, there is an eccentricity E1 and E2. This means that in the verification of the diagonal members, I would have to check not uh, axial compression and axial tension, but I would have to check couple, bending, and axial force. Because there is this eccentricity E1 and E2, which results by, by, by this difference between the line of my system and the, and the central of my actual cross-section. Okay? So we remember, for, not, not for the upper and, 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 and lower core, but for the diagonal member we can have this eccentricity. But then when we do the uh, verification of the member, I need to take into account that there is this eccentricity. So the strain verification, the verification will be not only answer force, but will be coupled by the answer force with the bending given by the force times the eccentricity. Okay. If we have eccentric connections, 
fictitious string elements, string elements may be used. For example, you see here, look at this detail here. Theoretically, I should have done a detail where I have those two lines reaching this point, and then I should have had a support just underneath the center. Instead, as you can see, there is an eccentricity between the support and the center line. So, in this case, the regulation said here we should take into account this eccentricity using this uh, eccentric connection, this, this fictitious big element. So, in this case, just go here a detail. One, two, three. You see that here there is an eccentricity. The support is not underneath here. Support is eccentric. So in this case, what we need to do in our scheme, we need to add here a fictitious big element in the sub thousand, for example. If I add a fictitious big element, and here I put my uh, pin connection. Is that clear what I just said? Okay. In a first order linear elastic analysis, the effect of initial deformations and induced deflection may be disregarded if taken into account by the strength verification of the member. Again, what we said. Uh, last lesson is that if you do a first order linear analysis, which means that uh, I basically um, want to write all the equilibrium equations with respect to the other form of initial deformation, then I need to take into account the possible uh, effect of second orders, for example, buckling, by reducing the strength of the member. So, as we know, as we, are, as we are used to do. So the idea is that I do a first order linear analysis by solving this uh, system here using the normal equation that I learned in statics, which basically ignores the, the formation of the member. I find out all the strength demand. Then, in the strength verification, I need to remember that I need to check for lateral torsional buckling or for flexural buckling. So I need for each member to reduce the strength using the k-creep or k-c-y or k-c-x factor so the reduction factor of the strength side okay. of course it's very important when we design trusses to thoroughly check out of plane buckling which may be a very serious problem in trust design and we need to provide lateral bracing, lateral bracing to reduce the problem you can see here for example this System of trusses, there is a buckling, sorry, there is a lateral restraint. What is the lateral restraint in this member here? As you can see, there is a member, timber member, connecting all those trusses here. Well, there is one member here, one member here, and the member is not alone because maybe you, you cannot see well, but if you look thoroughly in your thought, you will see that there are also some steel rods running. In this way. So in the end, it's like having an additional truss running perpendicular to the main trusses. An additional truss made by this timber member on the bottom and by this diagonal steel rods between one truss and the other. So this additional, these other three additional uh, trusses are providing some restraints against out of plane buckling of the main trusses. So when we go to check the uh, when we go to check the flexural buckling of the main members, we can take into account that the effective length is not the total length from one side to the other, but is basically the length between those members providing some restraints out of plane. Okay? Remember, it's very important to provide those restraints because without them, there is no way that you can get a verification for how to bring back the satisfied. As you remember, we did this exercise for the 
when you do it along the lamine, we said at the very beginning, okay, let's assume that there are no restraints and do the lateral torsional flexion of the this 22 meter of the lamine. If you remember, we found out that that's what we shall call the E. There was no way to make this application satisfied. Then we need to, <coughs> we had to put some restraints and some, some cross tracing because otherwise those verifications, that verification would never be satisfied. Okay, so remember, be very careful about always about buckling, also from the frame that you are designing for the design. Also oh, here you see this model proof, you have the main trusses, one, two, three, four, and if you look between the main trusses there is other perpendicular trusses running in the other direction. You see here there is another truss here, repeated here, providing also here some restraints for out of frame buckling. So the outer loop is made by the main truss in this direction, some secondary trusses running in the perpendicular direction which main purpose is to provide some restraint for lateral torsional buckling. Now, some concepts about the serviceability limit states. Of course, we know that for timber structure, the check of serviceability limit state is very important because it may govern the design of the whole structure. So, for trusses, the limited value of deflection for beams applied both of the complete stands and to the individual deflections of the member between the knots. If you look at this table, which is given by uh, the Euro 5, we have some limiting value for deflection of beam. So, for instantaneous deflection, for example, instantaneous deflection due to the characteristic of rare load combination, the limit is to be considered L, so the total uh, length, span length over 300. What is that for the final deflection L over 200 and the final net deflection L over 250, which are the minimum, the, actually the maximum values suggested by the Euro 5. So, now how to calculate the instantaneous deflection? So, for the instantaneous deflection, we will have to uh, consider, as I said before, what is called as a characteristic or rare load condition, which is the sum of the permanent loads plus one basic action, for example, snow, plus the combination values of the other variable actions. So, typical load combination would be permanent loads, G1 plus G2, plus the snow load. We apply this load as a concentrated force in the nodes, and we saw by 2000 by hand this system in order to find out the instantaneous deflection. So the instantaneous deflection shall be less than or equal to the span over 300. Of course, now we will, we will say later, we will see later on how to do it in order to take into account about the flexibility of the connection itself. It's important anyway to know that this is to note that this is an instantaneous or elastic deflection, which means that for doing this calculation, the formula, we need to consider the mean value of the young modulus. So mean value of the young modulus of timber parallel to the break and the mean value of the slip modulus of the connection K7. Instead, when we when it comes to calculate a long-term deflection, for the final deflection. For the final deflection, what we do, we need to calculate the final deflection by considering that in addition to the instantaneous deflection, we have also the creep deflection. The creep deflection, as you may recall, is due only to the quasi-permanent load condition. The quasi-permanent load condition, as you can see here, is the sum of the, of the permanent loads plus the quasi-permanent part of the variable load. For example, to be permanent loads acting on the roof plus psi 2, so a coefficient equal to 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, depending on where it is located our building, times the snow. So only one part of the loads are associated with creep. So, how can we calculate, in this case, the final deflection? The final deflection will be the instantaneous deflection due to the rare or characteristic load condition, 
plus the print defection due to the quasi permanent load condition. Or, if you want, same thing, will be the final reflection, so instantaneous Q plus print, due to the quasi permanent load condition, plus the instantaneous deflection due to the difference between the characteristic and the permanent load condition. So, let's try to clarify a bit more this concept. W at the time t equal to zero. 
dot w is going to this, will be 5 over the angle of here we will have g plus psi 2s times l to the power of 4 divided by e j where e is the mean value of the unknown of feature. Okay. Now for the sake of simplicity, we are doing this exercise for the simply supported beam. That's for the step. Okay. So for the simply supported beam, I would calculate this at times the function due to the quasi permanent flow with the usual formula. 5 over 384 g plus psi 2 times s, which is the quasi permanent flow condition, times n to the power of 4 divided by the mean value of elastic uh, module of elasticity times, times j, which is the second moment of area. Okay? So this will be the instantaneous <coughs> Then, since I need since I need the low value for 50 years, I will have an increase. I will have an increase of deflection. An increase of deflection due to creep. Okay? This increase in deflection. This increase in the fraction. This is W inst. This increase in the fraction will be you can call W three. <coughs> w three is what is delta W at t equal 50 years, so the increase of the fraction between 0 and 50 years due to creep, this will be the creep coefficient of invert times this and the fraction. So this will be k death times w in fp. Okay, so we have this antenna depression, then we have this increase in creep, and then at the end of the 50 years, we increase, we uh, apply instantaneously the remaining values <coughs> of, uh, of the characteristic level. So we have a further increase here. W delta W is of Fc minus Fp. So W is of Fc minus Fp. So at the end of the 50 years, I said that I apply, so at the end of the 50 years, At the end of the fifth year, I apply the difference between here, the difference between the characteristic and the quasi permanent flow. So, Fc minus Fp. <coughs> so, this will be 5 over 384. Fc minus Fp times L to the power of 4 divided by E mean times J. So again, this is a mean value of the modulus, but this is for the difference between the characteristic and the quasi permanent of condition. So what we have done, let me try now to sum up what we have done. We said we need to calculate the final deflection due to the characteristics of condition. The final deflection is the deflection at the end of the service time, so after 50 years. So the final deflection will be a sum between an instant time deflection and a print deflection. 
Deci, asta are deflection due to the characteristic of condition. However, there is a great deflection due to only the quasi parameter of condition, which is only one part of the characteristic of position. So, in order to get the maximum deflection, I have to assume that I have a quasi permanent of condition type of all the fifth years. And then, at the end of the fifth years, I apply the difference between the characteristic and the quasi permanent of condition. So, the deflection after fifth years under the quasi permanent of condition can be calculated with this formula here. This one. And as you can see, if I write now total deflection, so W phi due to FP, so the, the final deflection due to only the quasi permanent of the operation, this will be W ins due to FP plus W pre due to FP. So this will be basically. W inst due to FP multiplied by 1 minus K delta. So, 5 over 324 G plus psi 2 S L to the power of 4 divided by E mean times j times 1 minus k delta. Okay? Now what I can do? I can write this. 5 over 304 times g plus psi 2 x n to the power of 4 e mean Divided by 1 plus k left times j. Okay? So in the end, I have discovered that the final reflection due to Fp can be calculated as an instantaneous reflection due to Fp with a fictitious model of elasticity. Rather than using E mean, I have to use E mean over 1 plus K delta. Okay? So this is called the effective modulus method. So the idea is that if I have to calculate the final deflection of a structure due to a certain node, I can replace the young modulus of the material with an effective modulus given by the young modulus divided by 1 plus k delta. Okay? This means that, for example, if I use this up to 1000 and I want to calculate the final deflection due to the quasi parameter of position, I can simply say to sub 2000 to use, instead of e mean, to use e mean over 1 plus k delta. And the value of the equation that I get is actually not this standardized one, but the final one. Okay? I just replace the sub 2000 in my analysis the actual Young modulus of the material with the effective modulus of the material, which is the Young modulus divided by 1 plus k depth. Well, k depth, if you remember, is stable, and this basically is the grid coefficient of the material. Okay? Of course, in this way, I don't get the final total final deflection. Okay? I get only the final deflection due to the quasi permanent of condition. Then I need to say to some 2000 that I have two low conditions in this case. I have to do a further analysis. Because in the first analysis, I have to use Fp in the system with the E mean divided by 1 plus k as the R module of the material. Then I need to do a second analysis. Uh, using as a node Fc minus Fp and the R modulus of the material is the R modulus of the material, the mean modulus of the timber.
Okay? So I do two analyses. First analysis I calculate the final rejection due to the quasi permanent condition. And this analysis I, I use the final model of elasticity, which is in mean divided by 1 plus kf. And then I do a second analysis under the law of Fc minus P, characteristic minus quasi permanent condition, in our case 1 minus psi 2 times S. No. Using as a <coughs> young module of the material, the actual mean module of elasticity. Now, in the case of a truss system, a truss system, we have a further complication. The further complication is that the flexibility of the total truss is not only due to the flexibility of the member of the piece, but also to the flexibility of the joints. So, we need also to model the joint. How do we model the joint? So basically, this is what we are saying. So let, let, let's go first to see how to model the joint. If I use a binary element model of the truss system, for example, sub 2000, I should release the end of the joint. You know that there is this option end release. The option end release allows us to release the end and to say that uh, at the end we don't have, a, of course, we don't have a fixed joint here, we have a, a pin connection, so for sure we need to release the degree of freedom of rotation, and then we need to add a stiffness. This stiffness here could be the elastic stiffness of the joint itself. How can I calculate the elastic stiffness of the joint itself? So how can I calculate the stiffness of this spring? Using the formula for the strict modulus taken from the Eurocode 5. So, for the Eurocode 5, basically, I have some formulas, a semi empirical formula, to calculate the slip modulus for fastener and connectors. For example, if I have dowels, I can use this semi empirical relationship, the mean density of the timber to the power of 1.5 times the over 23, for example. So for each double and for each uh, slip plane, I can calculate the value of the slip modulus. If I have a steel to timber or concrete timber connector, KSR can be calculated based on the density of timber and then multiplied by 2. In a joint like this, when I have a certain number of fasteners, then I can calculate the stiffness of the spring, the translational stiffness of a joint, by multiplying the number of uh, slip planes, for example, 1 or 2, times the number of fasteners, times k cell. So with a formula like this, I can calculate the translational stiffness of a joint, and then I can input this value in this spring here, in my sub-2000 model. So in the end, I will have a sub-2000 model made of beams and springs. For the springs, takes into account this flexibility between the diagonal members and uh, the member itself. Of course, if you have a, a system, a continuous system like this, for example, with continuous members <coughs> here, and then with joint in this way, In this case, I would, I would model this, all the springs would be here, basically. Spring, spring, element, spring. Now, as I said before, to calculate the reflection, 
We should do something like this. We should first calculate the final deflection, the final vertical deflection of this system, using the value, the final value of the module of elasticity, so E fin here. So each member should be modeled with a value of the module of elasticity given by the mean value of timber divided by 1 plus kf. And the springs, the spring should be modeled using a KSR theme, so a final value of the three modules, given by KSR divided by 1 plus 2 KDEF. Why 2 KDEF? Because the regulation said for a, for, a, for a connection, for a joint connection between timber and timber, the final value of the free coefficient of the connection can be taken by the one from timber multiplied by two. So for the connection, we take the k depth of the timber, but we multiply by two. Okay? So we should do a first analysis of this truss system under the permanent quasi permanent load, considering a timber with a young modulus given by E mean divided by 1 plus k depth. And for the springs, a slip modulus given by k cell divided by 1 plus 2 k depth. Okay? And I found a certain solution, certain deflection. Then I superimpose this, uh, to this solution another solution, which is an instantaneous elastic solution, taken from a load given by Fc minus Fp, and consider in this case as a young modulus of timber, the mean value of the young modulus, and as a slip modulus of the connection the k set without taking into account the k depth. It's a bit, uh, maybe it's not so obvious, but this is what we should be doing when calculating the long term reflection in this case. Is that, is that okay? Does it make sense? Do you have any doubt about this? We need to do two solutions. In one solution, to take a take it into account, we consider the final value, which is a e divided by 1 plus k net. In the second one, we do the standard solution only under the difference between the characteristic and the quasi permanent quantity to be good analysis. analysis. We remember also that for these systems here, we need also to take into account, as we said before, we need also to take into account the flexibility of the connection. So we need to, to model also this flexibility here. Okay. Then once we calculate the final deflection, we need to make sure you see, that final deflection must be less than length over 100 and the final net, net, net deflection less than L over 150. In general, the flexibility of the joints means that the trusses are subject to larger deflection of the solid beam. So we can expect to have for this kind of system larger deflection, particularly because, because the joints are flexible. So it's a good rule always to pre cover those beams. What does it mean to pre cover To install it not horizontal but with a with a uh, pre basically, with a, with a deflection upwards. Okay? So we install the system having already a deflection upwards. Now, what are friends? Uh, what is the value of this pre -cumber? Approximately, you see, L over 150. So we pre more or less with half the total, fi total final value. So L over 150. For a ratio between L and H of 12, or L over 200 for a ratio of L over H of 10. Okay? Now, of course, how, how to calculate this final value of deflection? We can use sub 2000, as I said before, using this, this uh, procedure, 
Or we can also use, if you want to do a hand calculation, we should also, we can also use the method of virtual work. The method of virtual work, what does it say? As you know very well, you study in uh, the of materials. If you have a system like this, and you want to calculate the reflection, you need to consider a fictitious system that should be loaded with a, a load which is homologous to the deflection that you want to calculate. So in this case, if you want to calculate the deflection here at the apex, we will have to apply a unitary load in the same direction, the same point as the deflection that we want to calculate. So this becomes what we call the system of uh, forces and stresses. And this is the initial system of displacement and deformations. Okay? Principle of virtual work, what does it say? It says that if I make this system of forces and stresses working for this system of displacement and deformations, the virtual work of the external forces would be the same as the virtual work of the internal forces. The virtual work of the external forces is 1 times W. There are no other external forces because there is three reactions. As you can see, they, don't, they, they, they cannot make any work because the, the external is kind of fixed. So the only external work is 1 times W. Work of external forces. This is equal to the work of the internal forces. Which internal forces do we have? What do we have? Of course, here all the axial force in the members and one I in the call. So each member has an axial force called N1I. And this N1, N1I will make it work for the deformations that we can read in this other system. What is the deformation of a, of a, of, of, of a member subjected to axial force? So if you have a member, loaded with an axial force and I and I what is the deformation here? so we said N1I internal force in this system will make it work for the displacement for the deformation in this system here this is the mirror, each, each uh, beam is subjected to a force and I. So what, what is the deformation here, the displacement here that we have to consider? Delta L is what it is. Delta L would be the deformation that we have to consider. So N, N, N1I will, N1I taken from here, will make a work for this deformation here. So we need to calculate this deformation, what we call Delta L I. What is delta L I in, in this system here? Delta, you, if you have a member subjected to axial forces, you have an axial force. You need to find out the, the deformation, let's say the, the, the displacement. How can you calculate the displacement? It's one of the properties of the decimal theorem. A shortening of a column. And on the A, A, N, this will be A to the N, I, times. Delta L is N times what? Delta L is equal to? N minus. Yes, but you need to, to, to correlate it. It is L final L minus initial L. So, if you look at the decimal theory, the delta Li is Ni times Li divided by Ei times Ai. Okay? And the formation, uh, yes, the formation of the decimal theory is Ni times Li divided by Ai times Ai. So, you see here, for each, for each beam, 
we can write n is 1 pi, cos in this system, time deformation is other system, so n i, the deformation in the other system is n i by i divided by a i by i. So this is the contribution of the flexibility of the beam themselves. And then we have the contribution of the flexibility of those springs here. See? Then we have to take into account with the principle of Milton Wall the deformation of those springs. So the deformation of those springs will be will be again N1i. To take one of these means, this is N1i. And this will make a work for the deformation of two springs, one spring on this end, and one spring on the other end. Okay? Because here is a reality we have some internal springs inside, which is the flexibility of the connection. So, N1i times, if you have a, a spring like this, subject to Ni, how can I calculate this delta Ni of the formation here? If I have a spring, the force is Ni. How can I calculate delta Ni? Delta Ni would be Ni divided by L, the stiffness. So, of course, the stiffness it depends on how many fasteners you have. If you have one fastener only, it would be K7 I. If you have n fastener, it would be n fasteners times K7. So in the end, the second contribution would be n1i axial force times the, def the deflection of the deformation of spring, which is ni divided by n1, ni1 times K7. So this, if you want, is the contribution of the deformation of the bottom spring, and then there is another contribution of the deformation of the top spring, because each member has two springs. It's not uh, that L I N I uh, uh, L I on E Z I two yeah. times two times. No, because there's only one. But we consider two springs, one half. No, 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 it's not a spring. This one, this one, this one, it's not a spring. This is the flexibility of the whole beam. Forget about the spring. This contribution here is without any spring. Okay? Then you add a spring. For the spring, you have one spring on one side, one spring on the other. So one third plus the other. Okay? So your member is one member plus two springs. And this will be n times because you have n bits. Okay? So in the end, this is what you get. Of course, if you neglect, if you do the normal calculation by neglecting the joint flexibility, they will consider only this contribution. Then the, 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 the limit, the flex, the, the, the deflection limits provided by Europe of 5 shall be half. Because you're going to ignore a, a quite significant contribution. So, either you consider the flexibility of the joints, and then you can apply the limits of the Euro 5. If you ignore the flexibility of the joints, so you ignore those two terms here, then you need to reduce the limit. At least to reduce by a factor of two. Because otherwise, you are, you are non conservative. Final demand, and then we finish because we are late. Just one thing to remember, the effect of the connection flexibility is much more important for serviceability in this state than for ultimate in this state. In other words, when I check the ultimate in this state of my system, I can also ignore the springs, those springs. I'm talking about always those springs here. So those springs here can be ignored in the model when I talk about ultimate in this state, because they don't change significantly the result. However, when I talk about serviceability in this state, I have to take that into account, because otherwise, I am not conservative, they are much more important. So in the end, if you want, this could be the system, the structural system for ultimate in the state, while instead, for serviceability in this state, I should always consider the system with the springs. Okay? 
Because if I compare, let's put it this way, if I compare the axial positive that I get with or without spring, spring, I get exactly the same. Well, if I need to compare the deflection with and without spring, I have a huge difference. So the spring should be always considered when I do some visibility instead. And again, we can't really ignore some visibility instead because we are not designing a rainbow scope, we need to be very deeper. And very often, some visibility instead is going to go back to the design. Okay? Okay, we, we were a bit in a rush, sorry for that, because before we went to see the, the, the lab, but I hope that was, uh, was, uh, anyway, was interesting to see, to see the test. I also remember, of course, that you, when you do the design of your members, you need to reduce the strength to always take into account uh, buckling. So buckling in play and buckling out of play, because they are both important. Okay, perhaps if you want to have a look at what we said today, or if you want to, again, to have to search some questions, we can clarify tonight, it's later, we can clarify on Monday. Because we have two concepts. Today we discuss about uh, how to take, how to calculate the dimension, which is, if you want, it's a extremely complex concept, the dimension is not that. And second thing, how to calculate the dimension of a trust system using the principle of equivalence, which is this. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Now we'll see you on Monday at 3 o'clock. Okay, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday I sent you a new very long presentation about how we, we, we stop with single story, we start talking about multi-story building. Which is the, I would say multi-story building, scientific design, and then a little bit of fire design, and then we should have finished by the, by the last week of the Christmas. So with me we should have another two weeks of lesson. And then the last week will be covered with Dr. Shumenda to finish, finish another thing to talk about the, the project. Okay? Okay, thank you.